Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to the July edition of the Tiny Mail Trailblazer series. So this is a place uh, where you're going to meet uh, people who really uh, movers and shakers, people who drive this uh, field of uh, machine learning at the edge forward, people who pioneer uh, their uh, technologies, their companies, their products, and people who really tiny mail masterminds. So our today guest is uh, Joram uh, Zilderberg. Uh, he is CEO of MZ Visual Sense. This is a, a company based in Israel, but uh, actually Joram is on a business trip in California uh, this week. So he's joining us from, 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 from California. And uh, in this series, um, you're going to learn the, the MZ Visual Sense uh, story, uh, what they do in this space, and hopefully you'll get inspired, educated, and illuminated by Yoram and, and his vision here. Before we start, uh, it is uh, my pleasure to acknowledge Tiny Mail Strategic Partners uh, for this series and for, for, for other events. It's analog devices, uh, AUN devices, ARM, Deep Light, HM Pulse, MZ Visual Sense, that's the company that Yoram um, uh, leads, uh, PhotoHub, GreenWave Technologies, Gravity Inc., HOTG, Imagimob, uh, ITMEs, ClickerTech, Latin AI, Nota AI, NXP, OctoML, Prophecy, Kixo. Qualcomm, Reality AI, Rixen, Renaissance, SAP, Seed Studio, SenseML, Silicon Labs, Sony Semiconductor Solutions, ST Microelectronics, Trimanalyze, Synaptics, Synsense, Sintiant, and TDK, and there are more companies joining in, in, in the pipeline and the paperwork. So if you're interested, please um, uh, send us email at sponsorship at tinymobile.org. Uh, another announcement is uh, we had a great summit back in March, and uh, as the world is opening up, we are going to host our first in-person Europe, Middle East, and Africa uh, Innovation Forum. It will take place in um, October, uh, in, the, in, in, in the first half of October, October 10 to 12, and it will be an in-person event. It will take place in Cyprus. Uh, kind of in the middle of Middle East, Europe, and, and Africa for this kickoff meeting. And the call for presentations is open until um, August 1st. So you can you can go to the website there, uh, it's tinyml.org, and, and you can get more, more information about this event. So we're very excited to, to be to see people in person again in just uh, three months. Uh, our next uh, Tiny Mail Trailblazer series will be with Professor Vijay Reddy uh, from, uh, from Harvard University. So Professor Reddy is known as a Tiny Mail academic maverick. So he's done a lot of uh, uh, work um, and, and research in this space. And he is also well known for his uh, Tiny Mail EDX activities globally. So I think it will be really exciting to talk about kind of a tiny ML vision from, from the academic world. So uh, August 3rd, 8 a.m., I think, uh, please, please join and you can, you can register now. And you can also join uh, tiny ML growing communities. I think uh, tiny ML has grown over 10,000 people over the past uh, couple of years. Uh, Meetup groups are quite active. You can join them there. Uh, or LinkedIn uh, groups are also quite active. And uh, you can also uh, join uh, the Tiny ML YouTube channel. That's where all the information is posted, including this video. It will be posted there by tomorrow. So you can, you can subscribe to the channel and you, you're going to get notifications and, 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 and new, new information that has tons of resources, over 400 videos and also uh, 7,000 subscribers there. So just encourage you to join. At this point, it is my great pleasure and honor to introduce our, uh, our wonderful host, uh, Chris Rowan. Chris is a, one of the tiny pioneers and a very enthusiastic and um, 
passionate about Kanye Mel to the point that he's joining us from his vacation today. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Chris. And Chris is really very well known in, in the in the tiny email community and very broadly in the in the technology high tech community uh, for for many accomplishments uh, he's done over the years. Uh, the most recent one was he co-founded and he was the chief. Um, uh, executive officer of Bubble Labs that was acquired by Cisco. That's where Chris is now. Uh, he's uh, in charge of WebEx products, uh, uh, AI, uh, AI part of it. And uh, he is also well, well known for, for his activities and his leadership uh, when he was at uh, Cadence. Uh, that was um, uh, acquisition of Tensilica that Chris also founded uh, back almost like 20 years ago. And uh, he was uh, pioneering uh, some uh, micro architectures and uh, embedded processors and uh, RX5 architectures and, and MIPS, so a lot of accomplishments uh, over, over many, many years. and. Chris is really one of the kind of key figures in the tiny email world, and we are very fortunate to have him here as a host. And uh, formally speaking, Chris has a degree from, from Stanford and from Harvard in, in physics and uh, electrical engineering. And uh, at this point, Chris, the stage is yours. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it is a, a pleasure and an honor to host this series because we really get a chance to weave together the stories of entrepreneurship and the stories of technology in tiny ML by talking with leading entrepreneurs and thought drivers from across the space to explore not just how does the technology work, but how does the technology become widely used? How does it proliferate? What is the combination of innovation and business that it takes to really make these things successful. And so I can't think of somebody who is better to talk to this month than Joram uh, Zilderberg, who is the CEO of, um, of uh, Emza Visual Sense, an Israeli startup company which has been working for several years in the area of uh, vision IoT, close to the edge, sensor-centric, uh, machine learning and, and sensing. And what we hope to do today is kind of explore some of the history, some of the current technology and products and challenges, and a little glimpse of the future of where this class of technology is going. Uh, welcome, Joram. Hi, Chris. It's a pleasure to be here. and. Uh... I'm really honored to be part of the Trailblazers. Great. Well, uh, the most appropriate place to start is a little bit of history. Tell me the origin story. Tell us the origin story for, uh, for EMSA. How did it come to be? How did you get involved? What has been kind of the way that the pieces came together strategically and as an organization? Okay, so actually EMSA has... Uh, Quite a unique story. Um, the, the company was founded uh, in 2006, so we're talking 16 years ago, and have been in the space of, uh, you know, that time it was called computer vision at the edge since then. So we were pretty much the pioneers in that space. And the company was founded by uh, some um, uh, pioneers that came from the industrial space who were the experts in computer vision. And they thought, why would we make a camera? But this camera would be an intelligent camera. So there was nothing like that. And taking this camera to the security space for surveillance and, and other uh, similar applications. And that's uh, how it started, uh, actually. Um, at some point, uh, when um, I joined the company, and it was like uh, 10 years after, we've thought that it would be better to move to a different space. The valuable position of uh, intelligent camera was not as strong. And, and that's what uh, we were seeing. And that was the point that we've been switching to the IoT. And we thought, okay, let's do just the same, but let's make it a little bit different in three domains. We want it to be really low power. We want it 
it to be really low cost and we wanted it to be very small in size. These three domains, we thought if we would just be in order of magnitude better than anyone else in anything that exists, that's what can actually um, get us to new markets and, and, and new territories. So what were some of the early use cases after this pivot towards an IoT space? What kinds of end applications became the first sweet spot for the adapted strategy? So, you know, being an Israeli company and with a lot of experience in the, uh, in the defense and, and security space, so we just thought, okay, let's, let's do the same uh, and take it to uh, the, the smart home, the residential security, you know, make, let's make those uh, cameras at home uh, more sophisticated, independent, battery-based. And that was the original thought that uh, we started with. Um, you know, keep in mind that when we started, there were, you know, the tiny mail disk didn't exist. Uh, there were no sockets, uh, you know, for such a solution uh, like us that, uh, um, uh, that we've started to do. So we've been really exploring the market in, in different spaces, where can that fit in? And, and that's how we started. And only later, um, you know, after we kind of set up the technology and we'll talk later, I guess, on the technology behind it, we, we kind of um, pointed ourselves into the consumer electronic space because we, we understood that if we can make things really, really low cost, that would kind of uh, uh, lower the barrier for adoption of AI in, in the consumer space, in the really high volumes, in, in, in millions of units. So that's what we've been uh, looking for. Right. So say some more about what the product is today. What combination of, of, of sensors and vision microcontrollers and software models and... Uh, and neural networks do you offer now? What is a typical set of components that they get from uh, EMSA? So, so EMSA in essence is, is, a, is a software company uh, with, with a very solid ground on, on computer vision and algorithms, but our dream was really to, to build the complete sensing solution. Um, and you know, there are three elements to, to create a sensing solution besides the algorithms. You need, a, you need a, a silicon to run on and you need a camera. Now, when, when we started, and, and, and again, we've been really dreaming on, on being much better than anyone else. So you know, in terms of power consumption, we've been looking at uh, one milliwatt. I remember when we started and I've been looking at the competitive landscape, and there was pretty much a very little number of companies and, and Movidius was there later acquired by Intel. And they've been talking about low power at the edge. And, you know, when we've been looking at the details, we understood that most of the solutions at the edge that are um, <coughs> talking about, um, about low power, it's, it's mostly in, on, on a watt, one watt. So, so technology wise, we've been really searching for something else. We've been searching for a camera that would be in the milliwatts, we've been searching for a processor that didn't exist that was in the milliwatt. And, and it, you know, keep in mind, everything should have been kind of a solution that would hit, let's say like five, uh, $5 solution. So, so that, that was actually our, our challenge um, when we started. So typically, or at least sometimes, when people are running sophisticated ML, at the edge, there's real tension between, well, how do I keep the power down very low, but how do I have very sophisticated models? And there is something of a trend to say, well, I'm gonna need some acceleration because those models are gonna do lots of convolutions or multiply adds or matrix multiplies, lots of different formulations of that. Where are you now? Where do you expect to go? in the kinds of acceleration, specifically for machine learning models that wants to be part of that, <clears throat> that close to the sensor uh, computing platform. So when we started with the, uh, you know, at the tiny ML space, uh, or as it was called the IoT, so there was nothing out there. There were no 
kind of uh, ASICs, uh, no accelerators. So, so we've been really focusing on, on how to run on a general purpose uh, uh, mm -hmm. silicon, uh, as long as it would be a little bit strong enough for, for our computation, and, you know, just uh, not too much of a memory. And, and that was our expertise really to squeeze and optimize our algorithms uh, to kind of uh, entertain this tension that you're talking about between Okay, is this processor strong enough for, for these use cases? Uh, is this enough memory to, to run the models uh, that we want to run? And, and, and that's where we, we started uh, with the very basic things. Today, naturally, as, as you know, technology progress, so, so we're starting to leverage more and more of the accelerators that are going out there. We, we work very closely with ARM on their ethos. We work with companies that are uh, developing their own proprietary accelerators. So, so the more you have, you know, the more we can use. But we always see ourselves really, I mean, our, our, our core competence and, and unique valuable position is to do it really, really small. So, so when there is a processor which would be, you know, too big and, and too strong, so we say, okay, we can do so many things with that, but that's that's not our space. We want to be, to be at the tiniest uh processor that is possible out there. Part of the fundamental philosophy of Internet of Things is this idea that you do lots of processing at the edge, but the full application involves layers which are local and layers that are cloud-based, such that you can think often of the IoT node as being just the first level filter. That is, it needs to recognize the broad circumstances under which everything is happening and may do a lot of recognition tasks. But ultimately, the full recognition or the full decision making is made in a distributed fashion. That means that you need uh, an IoT node which doesn't miss anything. You need low false negatives. But if you trigger, you might be able to trigger a little bit more often than absolutely necessary. You might be willing to pass on more information than is absolutely necessary up to the next level or the next level beyond that. How do you think about that question as you serve as a kind of filtering function about false positives and false negatives, how you figure out what technical goals you have for the local vision processing functions? So yeah, it's, it's, it's indeed a dilemma and, and to a lot of extent, it, uh, it, it really depends on the application. So mm -hmm. when, when we started and, and as I mentioned, we, we thought, okay, let's, let's mostly focus on, on the security market. So the, the, the notion of uh, false positive became really a big issue. I mean, it's not just that you wake up the system and consume more power. I mean, you're creating false alarms, which is exactly you know, what, what you're not supposed to do. Um, and, and honestly speaking, that we, we found that pretty tough. I mean, you know, the, the tension that we spoke before between the tiny email that, you know, after all, you don't have so many resources to really get to a perfection. So, so in a way, you better choose your battles. And, and that's where we thought that uh, if we go to the consumer um, space and, and specifically those areas that the wake up is not as critical as, as, as you call it. So, so that makes life a little bit easier. Again, you need to be intelligent enough because you're competing with alternative technologies that has this ability to wake up systems like time of flight and, and some redders and others. But, but if you can really take advantage of the vision, which, which gives you kind of a good way to judge about the wake up, about the uh, false positive uh, versus false negative, and, and then you get the, the disadvantage of, of, uh, of vision uh, comparing to all other options. And, and I think we found pretty much the, the right application and, and since we started focusing on, on the PC on notebook market, where we are uh, now and succeeding there. And that gave us a good compromise uh, on one hand to be better than the alternative technologies in terms of uh, the false uh, negative. 
On the other end, if you do have false negatives, so okay, so you can see a little bit more power, but it's not really a critical mission that uh, hurts the, the value of your proposition. Mm -hmm. And what are the key use cases or functions in the in the laptop in the PC that you're now fulfilling? So, so when we started, as, as I mentioned, we kind of looked around, and, you know, where we can. Um, where we can focus and bring our, our kind of a solution, the sensing solution. It, and, and, you know, in, in a way, I believe that uh, lack plays a kind of a role with every startup. Uh, mm -hmm. when, when, when we started, so, you know, we, no, no one was talking about PC, no one had any sense about PC being, you know, a potential application to adopt uh, AI. And it, it kind of happened to be that when we met with Intel in the first place, um, they had this vision and, and pretty much, uh, you know, they kind of uh, invited us to the party. I mean, they had their own solution cooking there. Um, and, and they've been looking exactly for a company like us. And, and so, you know, we looked at the, the application and I'll explain a little bit what we do, but it was, Again, I think that's also a lesson learned for, for startup companies. I mean, we, we, we kind of put for ourselves what is, what is our value position? And, and we, we kept looking at the, again, the cost, the power and size. And when we, we started looking at the PC space, we understood, I mean, that, that's a perfect fit. You need to be really low power because you're actually um, sensing when, when your, your PC is in, in a sleep mode. You really need to be low cost because after all, I mean, no one will adapt a solution that costs $15. I mean, not, not for this kind of application. And you need to be very small because you fit into a very small space in terms of uh, the, the, the industrial design. So, so that was really great fit. And, you know, it's, it's a very small company with like uh, 10 people. We just focused on that. We kind of left behind everything else, every other applications, and we just focused on the PC market. Got it. I'm curious to understand how you, a little bit of your financial history in, in just one specific sense that um, you have this long history as a, as a independent company, but then eventually you formed an alliance with Hymax in Taiwan, such that they actually became 100% owner of 100% shareholder in 2018, I think. In what ways did that affect how you do things? And in particular, how do you get the best of both worlds, having both this strong financial backer on the one hand, but maintain the, the, the spirit and the agility of an Israeli startup? How do you, how does that balance work? Um, so first of all, we've been really lucky to find uh, IMAX and, and we can speak later about the, the synergy and how we found, found them. I mean, I think it's a, it's a really interesting uh, story by itself. Um, and then the financial, the, the financial aspects is, is, you know, something that any startup is, is kind of dealing with. And, and, you know, we, we kind of restarted the company um, in, in 2016 again, moving away from these security cameras. And, and you know, we, we dropped all the revenues that we, we had and we pretty much started from scratch. Um, we had no money back then. Uh, we approached VCs and, and, you know, we're not the typical company for a VC already 10 years old, you know, security space. And, and, and indeed, um, uh, we've been looking for a strategic partner and that's, uh, that, that was really nice uh, match between us and, and Hymax. Mm -hmm. The other nice thing about Hymax is that, um, and that's very different. And, and again, there, there is a lot of uh, difference uh, between being uh, acquired by, by a Taiwanese company and, as opposed to uh, a US-based or, or European company, because mm -hmm. We, we've been really kept very, very independent. I mean, you can see by the name, we've, we've, we haven't become a subsidiary. I mean, like uh, uh, in our this subsidiary of HIMAX, uh, we kept our name, the Emsa Visual Sense uh, name, and, and we've been 
kind of lucky to get funded and, and reach our goals, which took a few years because we started developing a silicon uh, to meet our uh, objectives. And, and until recently, when uh, we kind of uh, started to create our own revenues, um, we had the luxury to be independent Israeli startup company with all of the notion of uh, innovation that, uh, as, as you know, Israeli companies are, are very uh, yeah. famous for. Yes, right. Now, as you've gone through this history, yeah, there are always, always for every startup company, some roadblocks, some setbacks, some pivots. Tell me the story of one pivot, some case where you really found yourself running into a, a, a wall. And since startups usually can't break through walls, they have to find a way to go around, go in a new direction. Tell me an example of how you had adapted. What problem you hit? How did you respond? So on our path to, to create the, the uh, technical solution, so you know, we, we started with Hymax because they had the right component, the camera component, which was really good fit for us. But then this, this is one out of these three elements that build the solution. Uh, of course, we, we had the, the algorithms, but we, we had to create everything from scratch. Uh, there was no ecosystem back then. There was no tiny email or TensorFlow light and no accelerators and nothing whatsoever. And we, we you know, we, we didn't have any silicon to run on. And we started shopping around to see what you have on the shelves as, as a silicon that could uh, actually uh, serve the, the purpose and, and, and meet our goal to be at the right price point in the PowerPoint. And there was nothing there. We've been really checking and, and testing and running on uh, different uh, silicon vendors. And, and we, we basically hit a wall because there was nothing other that uh, could, could meet the uh, the right power efficiency with, with the right cost. Um, we've been lucky enough to exactly at that point to be acquired by, by Hymax and Hymax being a silicon company. So I just kind of had to convince them that uh, it's not just that they, they bought a software company, now they need to make a silicon and, and we know what we need. So, so let's, let's start doing that. And, and that, that was the breaks when we started creating and, and defining a silicon that was that didn't exist. And, and the existence of this silicon two years after is actually what enabled the, the, what we're doing now in terms of a solution. And you know, we, we, we practically became the first company, as far as I know, that uh, started to sell vision-based tiny email in, in millions of units. So, so that was really the breakthrough back then to create mm -hmm. the right technology solution to fit um, as opposed to let's see what's available out there. And, and what have been the, the business or the cultural or the technical implications of this up integration going from primarily supplying algorithms to something where you're really building much more of a complete subsystem. And I'm guessing that includes the sensor and the, the, the logic chip and the algorithms in one, in one physical or maybe virtual package. How, how has that changed things? So, so yeah, I mean, in, in a way, you know, you bring the algorithm, you bring the silicon, you bring the hardware, but, but there is a lot of uh, kind of uh, know-how in the fusion of all these pieces together. And, and, and we found that, uh, you know, we got, uh, you know, we, we brought this expertise on board. We, we, we are experts in algorithm, silicon and vision and, and really fusing everything all together. That became one of our major core competence and, and how to really define the use cases in a way that would fit the camera, but would fit the algorithm and would fit the silicon. So, so the system level solution, which by the way, it's a strong part of many Israeli companies, be became kind of an essence uh, to, to, to what we do. Um, moving forward, but it was, we found that it's not just this, uh, this uh, micro system that we are building and, and we also need to integrate with other systems, especially when you're on the PC level. So, so that's where we found that we need to develop 
further expertise that uh, relates to the, the drivers, micro drivers that run on the PC, software stack, uh, Windows, uh, Intel stack, and so much more beyond just uh, bringing the algorithm. So, so I think the lesson is, is really when you bring a solution, you, you cannot really focus on this micro thing. You need to look at the macro picture and develop the skills to, to create the whole solution. Yeah. Now, for, for this kind of business model and this kind of module that you're providing, what's the role for ecosystem? Obviously, you're plugging into an established PC ecosystem, but what kind of partners, what kind of suppliers, what kinds of uh, other components do either you choose or your customers need to choose to get full value from, from what you're doing? And how do you develop that ecosystem? So, so, so maybe it's a, it's a good point also to explain what kind of uh, things we do, especially in the PC area. So, so indeed, we, we're providing the all contextual awareness uh, for the PC. Uh, so that, that's an independent system. So mm -hmm. we can tell if there is a user and uh, we can tell if the user is, is watching the screen or maybe it's like uh, watching other screens and then we, we optimize the, the way that the PC works. We, we can identify if the, the users, uh, if the user walks away, uh, we can wake up the system uh, when the user kind of get uh, close to the system. So, mm -hmm. so all of that is done as, as on, a, on a system independent level by a very small chip. But you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, that's not enough. So you know, we, we provide all of that, um, but eventually we, we send out some metadata that say, okay, there is face, there is no face, there is a human, there is no human, and, and some, something needs to be done. Uh, and, and that's where you connect with the other elements of the system. That's where, for example, if you kind of approach the, the PC and, and that's, that's fine, it's, it's, you know, you wake it up, but now the, the, the authentication needs to kind of kick off and, and we don't do the authentication. So that's where you start working with Windows Hello. So there are a lot of pieces, uh, as, as you just said, in the system, in the ecosystem that relates to kind of taking uh, the data and, and fuse it also with other data. I mean, we are one sensor out of many that exist on the platform. So, mm -hmm. so there is a lot of, uh, there are a lot of partners that um, all together feed this kind of data into some sort of fusion hub and, and then go up to the levels, the, the, the upper stack levels that enjoy and, and, um, and, and activate. Uh, for, for example, I mean, we can tell if the user is now engaged with the PC. That's fine, but what do you do with this information? Yeah. Uh, so, so the value is that uh, if you kind of uh, uh, look away from, from, from the monitor, so, so the screen kind of blurs, uh, it, it's called adaptive dimming. And that's to provide both privacy, so because no one is now looking at the screen as well as power consumption. But we cannot do that by ourselves. We can just uh, provide the, the, uh, the metadata for that. And that's where you can connect with the other sub partners that, okay, someone eventually needs to dim the screen and, and it's, it's a all complicated solution that works very tightly together. Mm -hmm. So where do you go from here? What do you see three or five years out as the natural evolution or the consequences of what this kind of technology can do? What are some of the, the wild ideas or the inevitable directions that this kind of edge vision functionality uh, could lead to or will lead to? So, yeah, I mean, things change uh, rapidly in terms of technology and, and what we've been starting six years ago is completely different now and, and will be completely different in five, six years from now. When we started, there was nothing out there. So we, we had to be really vertically integrated. We, we had to invent everything. We, we, we even invented the algorithms. There was no uh, models that could fit into the memory size that we had in mind. And, and we, you know, we created silicon because there was nothing else. And we, there was a camera that uh, Hamas created because there was nothing else. And, and 
so there, there is a lot of advantage in, in doing that, but, but it's, it's also kind of uh, puts you in a in space that you need to put a lot of effort for every application. I mean, we've been working for like two years on, on the use cases to make the things work on the PC lab. Now, when you look forward and you, you're looking at what's happening now, first of all, from the silicon perspective, there's so many options being created or had been just created out there that you can really take advantage of. So if we just, we created one chip, but now you have possibly 10 different uh, ASICs that uh, you can custom and, and you can basically choose. Maybe one would, would go to a PC, but one would go to the, the other consumer and one would go to industrial. So there is a big choice of things. And really where I see the, the market is going and of course the development of uh, the old tiny ML space and TensorFlow Lite and automated systems, um, that brings us, I think, to a point that the adoption of AI would not just be on those applications that uh, takes a lot of investment, but reward you with many millions of units. But the real kind of a holy grail is, is to go after those applications that maybe are just 10,000 of industrial machines. And, and it wouldn't take you like a year to, to, to uh, deploy that, but, but you know, a week. And I, and I think the development of the ecosystem is taking us there slowly. That's, I think that's the dream. Where are the technological bottlenecks to get to that next fundamental level? If I had a magic wand and I could say, I get you know, 10X more sensor resolution, or I get 10X more compute, or I get 10x more developers to work on different algorithms, what of those things or something else would have the biggest impact? What, if you could sweep away a bottleneck, what would be most uh, impactful on the potential for this class of technology? So it's, it's a subset of things, right? Because you wanna make it again, small and low cost and low power. And, and, you know, if you put a high definition camera, I mean, we, we kind of shy away from that because we, we want to use a really low resolution camera and still be able to, to kind of uh, do the use cases that we have in mind. So, so it's not necessarily going after the, the, the biggest and the greatest. Right. It's actually really cherry picking what is enough, not too much. So you can really stay at the tiny and the tiniest uh, space. Um, memory, by the way, is a big bottleneck because in terms of technology, I mean, it's eventually it's a showstopper, you know, to, to store your, your image and store your algorithm. Maybe if there was a, and I'm coming from the memory business uh, in my previous life. So, so if you could really squeeze uh, more memory into lower space and, and reduce the cost of chips and reduce the power consumption of chip, that could, by the way, be a big leap for also, so for these kind of essential devices. Of course, accelerators that are efficient enough in terms of uh, uh, you know, the, the computing power, but, but yet not too costly and not too power hungry, so, so that's another space that uh, we're watching and we're happy to leverage anything that comes out. We, we recently had a pretty nice uh, demos we've been making with ARM on, on what our technology do. Um, and, and I think the secret is how to make more from less. That's, that's, I think that's the essence of TinyML basically. Yeah. Because otherwise we, we would have been using right, an NVIDIA or an Intel device or, or others. Right. I would have been very surprised if you said more resolution, because there's really so much semantic information, even in low resolution images. There are, my sense is that we have just an unbounded number of things we could tell from quite low resolution images if we just had enough different application developers and algorithm people to, to exploit all of those different insights we could get from, from image streams. But I, I think it's really interesting that more memory, but not more resolution 
is important, suggesting you want more intermediate results. You want to be able to look at multiple frames. You want to be able to look across time and space in order to make decisions about what's going on uh, in this scene. What about power? If my magic wand said, oh, you could be 10x less power, would that matter? Or are you already down at a power level where you're kind of in the noise level with respect to the, to the power budget? If, if you could be you know, 100 microwatts instead of a milliwatt, would that change your uh, use cases in a significant way? So um, <clears throat> power is a big thing uh, when it comes to quite a lot of applications and, and uh, you know, in, in, in the PC space, uh, we were running on just a few milliwatts, but there is relatively quite a big battery in, uh, in, in the notebook. If you go down uh, in power, so, so that opens up, um, you know, more applications, you know, the, the kind of the dream of the lick and stick thing, but not just lick and stick, but lick and stick that uh, remain there with a small battery for, for a few years. I mean, mm -hmm. looking at the smart building space, right? I mean, you, you want to kind of spread hundreds and thousands of sensors in a building and you don't want to hook to the, the power infrastructure because that's very costly, but you don't want to run, over, you know, run um, after, uh, uh, you know, changing batteries throughout the buildings every day of the year. Uh, you want something that really stays there for five years. So, so if you really kind of cross the next barrier for power consumption, I think that opens up uh, many applications um, that, that couldn't exist before. Yeah, that whole area of battery powered IoT is, is particularly compelling because you have this complex interaction as well between the power cost of communication and the power cost of, of accurate triggering. And you, you, you can't afford to have too many false positives because then you lose it from a True. power perspective in communicating up. And you can't lose it from the standpoint of uh, having uh, too, you know, if, you, if you're too intelligent, your battery doesn't last. So you have everything, <clears throat> really gets complex at, at that level. What do you think, to the extent that you've looked at these battery operated vision systems, what do you think is going to be the next breakthrough or what is the key challenge that people face to make that you know, multi-year battery life for a vision sensor-based IoT? So, you know, you need to look at the all elements of the solution. And, and uh, if you're able really to make some breakthroughs and, and, you know, use a really low power sensor, I mean, when, you know, before we met IMAX, I mean, the, the reason we met IMAX is that they came out, you know, and they were making the first of its kind, uh, one milliwatt camera. I mean, you know, every other camera was, was 100 milliwatts. So, so this was back then the breakthrough that uh, made this solution happen. So you really need to kind of, uh, the technology need to progress in, in multi layers in, in terms of camera on one end, um, in terms of the efficiency of the ASIC on one end. And again, without growing the, your, your memory size without definitely without using any external memory. And also from the algorithm perspective, you need to kind of um, advance in the efficiency and, 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 and that's where the system levels come because it's just not just uh, running very complex algorithm on a very um, small footprint of a memory. It's also how to, you know, as we said before, to leverage, you know, just a few pixels uh, and, and the lower the better and still kind of uh, get what you need. So, so you know, Talking about the camera, when when we started, and you know, we were creating a space of um, of visual sensing, and, and the language that everyone was talking is, what's the resolution that you're using? What's the frames per second? Uh, how is your um, ISP working? But hey, that doesn't matter because we're intelligent AI device. No one looks at the picture, but the device, and no one cares what's the uh, you know, the, the resolution is, is, is as far as I can judge and, and have a good 
way to to implement my use cases with with a good level of um, false positive and false negative. So so that's where the technology really kind of uh, need to focus on. Yeah, I'm curious where you think that goes from a sensor perspective. I often think about and talk about this notion of a cognitive hierarchy. You know, the, the purpose of the lowest level trigger is to be smart enough to wake up the next level, which does some more sophisticated processing and wakes up the next level. You can certainly think about that from a sensor perspective that you know, in some conceptual form, at least, you start with a one pixel sensor and that wakes up a 10 by 10 pixel sensor which wakes up a hundred by a hundred pixel sensor, which eventually wakes up a thousand by a thousand pixel sensor. Maybe not literally like that, but conceptually this idea that if you want super, super low power, you want to have a, a cascade of increasing uh, power. Is that a natural consequence of trying to drive to both greater intelligence and lower power? in these systems or where will it go if not to that kind of a sensor hierarchy just as we have a computing hierarchy so so indeed the this the, what you're describing is is a very typical architecture that there is a sensing smart sensing device that uh, eventually wakes up the the really smart device that is much more capable and and you know can do much much more with with you know much stronger uh, processing and, and naturally also higher power consumption. So the, the the real objective is how to make your edge device smarter and smarter and smarter, because you know waking up uh, the, the the beast is is easy, but it has its cons consequences in terms of your overall performance and power efficiency. So yeah. that's where we are focusing our development. So so if if in the past we've been kind of um, looking at uh, face detection. So let me just recognize there is a face, any face. So I wake up the Nexus and to say whose face is there. But now, you know, with the progress that we're making in algorithms and the efficiency of the ASIC and everything, now we do what we call the face ID. So that means, um, and you know, if there are a group of users, I can identify who's, who is that if, if it's, um, if it's a, a family running a, a consumer device, so who is that in the family that is now operating the device? So that's already the next level of, uh, of um, better uh, intelligence mm -hmm. that I can apply. And if next I can do more than that and really authenticate even to some level, so that's even better. So, so this kind of um, uh, chase after even better intelligence in, at the edge, um, mm -hmm. but yet not making it more complicated and expensive. That's, I, I think, what we're struggling all the time in terms of our next and next generations. Great. Let me take a moment to solicit uh, more questions from the audience. This is gonna be a great opportunity to quiz Yoram on things about both of this ultra low power vision space and about uh, about EMSA. So uh, post your questions and we'll try to, to get to them. We have about 10 minutes left. So I'm really interested to learn a little bit about how has the organization of your team evolved? Because obviously as an entrepreneur, one of the key questions is, well, what skills do I need? What kinds of engineering talent do I need? What marketing and sales and product people do I need? What kind of you know, administrative support? How do you decide how to allocate resources across a team in order to have enough to get the job done, but of course, stay within the, the tight constraints of, uh, of, of a budget. What do you decide is most important as you, uh, as you organize a team? Yeah, so, so naturally, I mean, we're still a startup company, although we are owned by a bigger company. Uh, and, and as any startup company, you want to stay lean and mean. Yeah. And there are basically two 
kind of challenges that you're having. One is on the technology side and one is on the business side. Yeah. Starting with the business side, I mean, the, the, we're getting really, really tough kind of a challenge because, you know, we were pioneers in this business and, and we are creating the sockets. It's not that we're, you know, we're educating the market. It's not that there are kind of millions of uh, these kind of sensors out there and let us just be a little bit different, a little bit better. Um, it's it's a little bit, you know, kind of uh, inventing the, the old market. And, and from that perspective, you need um, a small and, and but really sharp team out there uh, in the market to, to do the, the business development and really to kind of educate uh, the, the OEMs on, on what they can do, what they could do with this kind of technology. So, so that's one type of uh, challenge. And, and on the technology side, uh, basically, so, so you know, our, our essence is, is providing a complete solution. So it's, it's not a typical company from the R&D perspective because we have a combination of uh, a team that uh, comes from the visual side. Um, we come from the embedded space because, you know, we, we, we need to implement uh, everything we do and squeeze it onto a very small uh, memory architecture and an ASIC right. architecture. We have algorithm developers that are really kind of expert in optimizing things. So, so that's the combination of uh, people that... Uh, um, we, we, we have in the company. And again, it's, it's, we, we are a small company all together in the business side and, and technology. We are, we are about 20 people. Wow. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a tough challenge and you probably need, you know, people who are simultaneously both real experts in their particular field, but then also pretty broad because you, you need people to cover a, a wide range of, of different things just because any size business needs to think about supporting its customers and you know paying its bills and you know inventing some new algorithm yeah. and uh, and making sure that the market knows what you're talking about it's all these moving parts <laughs> i love that part of it but it's also constant juggling because there are, there are never enough hands I am, I'm curious also how you deal with um, one of the most essential uh, challenges for a, a startup company. And I, you know, we, we've talked indirectly about this already, but let me make it more explicit in that um, it never works for a startup to be 20% better in 10 different dimensions than the competition. It's almost inevitable that you have to be way, way better trans in a transformative way, in a radical way better than the competition in one dimension. And then the other dimensions don't matter if you're enough better in one way. Over time, how have you uh, chosen the dimension in which to be better? And what do you do as you're successful? Because as you're successful, everybody kind of wakes up to oh, that dimension is really, really important. I need to compete there too. So, you know, it's easy to say, well, let me look at what Intel and Qualcomm and, and, and MediaTek are doing, and I'll just make sure that I'm different in one different way. But eventually those people or, or organizations like them sort of say, oh, I see that there is a real market here. And they start to get good along the dimension that you think you want to be wildly better. So, so how do you evolve that dimension in which you're wildly better? So, you know, when, when, when we started, there was nothing out there, right? So, so it, was, uh, it wasn't easy, but uh, we, we chose our space and, and we decided that, uh, you know, we're, we're now talking here as part of the tiny email organization. Um, and, and one of the major things was always focus, focus, focus. I mean, there was always the temptation of... Uh, yeah, we could do that application, that market, maybe bigger, cheap, but you really need to focus because we, we kind of recognize that our major valuable position, the, the core competence of the companies is where the tiny goes tinier. 
And, and we always decided to focus on that. And that's where we, we started in the PC market. And indeed, as you said, you know, we became successful and we've been, became the first company to sell and make business out of it. So yeah, uh, competitors came aboard and, and we have competitors and you know, some are better, some are not. And now you need, you need to look around and say, okay, that's, that's a new competitive landscape. These are uh, your, you know, your new, new options in the market. Let's focus on, on something else market-wise and also technology-wise and, and without kind of uh, um, looking at and, and telling what the next thing is. But, but that's where we kind of uh, judge and, and say, okay, what's our next focus? And, and again, the lesson that I can take here is really focus on one thing that you feel that you could be really the best, the best in the market. What's really meeting not just the requirements of the market, but the, the kind of uh, DNA of, of your company. Yeah, right. This question uh, just came in, uh, and it goes right to this core issue of memory. Can you comment on the type of memory currently deployed in EMSA product and whether in-memory compute is a promising candidate to extend low power, low cost edge vision? Um, so, so we're leveraging uh, standard uh, ASIC and silicon, and, and naturally we're using just uh, uh, embedded uh, and onboard SRAM because you know, DRAM is is you know, too big and, and too power fit, too power uh, hungry. Um, and you know, from our perspective, you know, the smallest uh, memory that we could use that's an advantage. Um, Naturally, again, the breakthrough could come if your memory would be faster, if you, your memory uh, would be more efficient on, on you know, the silicon size, because you know, when you look at the, the ASIC today for AI, you know, even if you're really, really kind of uh, efficient and, and we use like two megabytes of memory, that, that's, you know, when you wanna achieve the, the power and cost, that's still the memory is you know, a big portion of uh, what you pay for um, in terms of silicon. Mm -hmm. so, so any breakthrough in that would definitely push this whole uh, solution uh, forward dramatically. Yeah. So memory really is pretty key. Yeah. Well, on that note, let me uh, pass the baton back to Evgeny to wrap up. Thank you so much, Joram. This has been delightful. Uh, and I appreciate the, your sharing so much about uh, about EMSA Tech, EMSA Vision. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Yeah, th thank you, Yorma. Thank you, Chris. It's been really a great discussion on the on the EMSA success story. And uh, talking about success stories, we are in the in the Trailblazer series. I have my favorite question, Yorma, for me. What does it mean for you to be successful? What 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 is success for you? You know, kind of like a philosophical question, a little bit, but. <laughs> Um, you know, we, we had a dream uh, that uh, when we, we started and, and there was nothing out there and, and we created and, and we kind of fulfilled this dream on bringing uh, the tiniest device ever. And that was technology wise, that was the, the, the first thing that uh, kind of uh, we, we were able to achieve and, and I think not necessarily less important is the fact that you make it commercially successful. And, and we've been lucky to be the first one to bring tiny vision-based tiny email into that kind of a success wheel, you know, on the business side, on the volume side. So, so I think that's really what makes us really happy and uh, with, with what we are doing. So basically pursue your dream and kind of take it all the way to be a commercial success. Yes, technology and commercial, yes. Great. Well, thank you again, Joram, and thank you, Chris, for, for the great session. So just again, I would like to acknowledge, acknowledge our uh, strategic partners and sponsors shown here, Executive Arm, Edge Impulse, Qualcomm, Sintiant, and we have Platinum sponsors, uh, DeepLight, ClickerTech, Reality AI, Renaissance, uh, now they're together. Uh, Sony Semiconductor Solution and Gold Sponsors, uh, Analog Devices, uh, PhotoHub, 
uh, latent AI, NXP, uh, and uh, uh, Seed Studio, uh, SenseML, ST Microelectronics, Synaptics, and Synsense. And we have a list of silver sponsors again. Thank you for joining uh, the Tinymel uh, Trade Blazer series. We'll see you again in August. And thank you, Chris, and thank you, Yoram, for the for the great conversation. Really, really uh, inspiring. Thank you so much. Thank you, Evgeny. Thank you, Yoram.